course, um, we're delighted that, that Martin was, was happy for us to, to meet together in the Institution of Structural Engineers. It seemed so right to come here as a group, especially as a group of professionals, um, to, to just remind ourselves of the, the contribution that Michael made to, the, to our profession, to the industry, and often to our own lives and the, the development of our own careers. So fitting place to do that, and as Martin says, delightful to see Michael's name up there on the wall. Uh, we are hoping, uh, I, I think Effie and, and Sarah are certainly due to come. I think they're probably stuck in traffic, but because of, uh, because of the pressing of time, um, we're going to, to start. Um, I just want to, uh, to remind everybody, uh, after we have finished here celebrating Michael, the engineer, the professional, uh, we're all going to walk a very short walk, about three minutes to St. Luke's, which is a fabulous hall just around the corner where we're going to be able to relax and talk with each other, um, have our memories together. There's an exhibition there of Michael's work and quite a few quotes of things he said, and you can almost hear them in the room when you see this. Um, there'll be refreshments, of course, and music, music that we think Michael would, would approve of. We've been reasonably careful there and um, wouldn't want to upset. And, and then there will be a few speeches there, perhaps more of a more personal nature here. It's very much uh, celebrating Michael the, Michael the engineer, if you like. And what, he, he was young, yes, once, uh, as, as were we all. Uh, Michael, I, I, I've known Michael for quite a long time, um, since I was 18. Uh, clearly there are others in the room who have known, known Michael for, for even longer. But I, I wanted to try to help create a story of, of Michael just by going through all of his documents, his files, his, his um, past presentations, and trying to pick out the essence of, of the career that, that he had. And of course I'm going to make a few blunders, I'll get a few dates wrong, but, but I think we can get the, the essence of the man. The engineer, he was much, so much more than an engineer. I was going to say, but I'm not sure I quite understood the meaning of the word, a polymath. It feels the right sort of word where, where Michael took knowledge and, and um, sustenance from other fields, not just, not just engineering. And this, this reminds me very much of Michael. It's like grin as he's about to say something really rotten about your design. <laughs> and, and never mind, he was going to be absolutely accurate and right. So it was important uh, that we heard from Michael. But such a, a fire um, uh, and passion for the quality of what the practice um, was doing. And these, these quotes from, from the Book of Remembrance that we've been collecting, his warm-hearted, his creative engineering, his influential, uh, the influential figure in the industry, teacher and mentor, very much I see him in that role. And ultimately, this deep care that he had for people and the planet. And that comes through, I think, in his work, as we see. A distinguished career, if you, education and career on the left, and very wide and distinguished contribution to profession and industry that we can see on the right. Uh, I, won't, I won't go through everything, but you can see he didn't hang, ar he didn't hang around, uh, uh, Michael. Um, early in, in that career, having finished his education, or the formal education at Cambridge and then Cornell, um, he, soon, who, he soon found himself working at Arabs and working in Ted, Ted Happold's team in a little corner block on, on Soho Square, which you can s still see in all, all its grim glory on the northwest corner. Early work, uh, perhaps not fully supporting the innovation that we were going to see later, but a, a fabulous little and highly successful art centre in the University of Warwick, uh, an important project, and perhaps cementing Michael's, Michael's future with a lot of um, cultural work and his, his fascination for theatres and so on. Uh, very important. But in Ted's group, fired up considerably by a young Ian Little, um, there was a lot of very innovative stuff already happening back in the, early, in the early 70s, and a relationship was struck up with Fry Otto, which certainly had a big influence on, on Michael. I think we can say that Michael turned out to be the, the, the engineer who could give Fry the time and the focus and the attention that Fry needed to, to help uh, bring some of his projects to fruition. So, 
um, early work in, in, in Ovarups. Michael was in the new, newly set up lightweight structures laboratory um, at the time, and that was, that was really his home, and that's where I first met him as I timidly hung nails on a model to try and help work out how this project was going to happen. But you can see, surrounded by innovation at, at a, very, a very early stage in that team. Um, according to Terry, who's here, he, he tells me that Michael was, was very involved in the, uh, in the Mannheim erection sequence and the challenges they were to work out how to, how to build this, this phenomenally innovative piece of work. Um, although ultimately he didn't go to site to, to carry it out. Um, he, le he left that in the capable hands of, of Terry Ely. And indeed it, it was built. And this was, was early days in those, those, um, that work, collaborative work with, with Fry Otto. Interestingly enough, um, shortly after that, I, I see Michael was working on a, a project that became very, very important to the team, the DICE, the DICE tent, the opening of the BP-40s oil field up in, in, in Aberdeen. And the Queen was visiting, and, and she and the hundred, the thousand guests needed shelter. And so this drew Michael straight into the important um, field of membrane structures, um, surface stress structures, and so on. If I could just welcome... Effie and family, a Amy and Sarah, hello. <laughs> Sorry the London traffic got the better of you, but lovely to see you all. Yes, ah, right. And um, we, we, we wanted to get, to get started, and, and so everything can... But we're, all, we're only in 1975, so <laughs> there's plenty of time to go, yes. But this, this, is an important, this is an important project, I feel, and I remember uh, seeing Michael, I didn't know what was going on, but he seemed to be working with lots of membrane models and so on in the Lightweight Structures Lab, and there he was uh, pulling this one out of the bag. It wasn't long after that that, uh, that Ted got a twinkle in his eye and was off and, and, and set off with a, with a group of, of partners to Bath at the University of Bath and setting up an office in Gay Street as Bureau Happold founding partners of which Michael was a, a notable one, perhaps the youngest, I'm not sure. And of course, t life in Bath was a whole different ball game, much more fun, the sun came out every day, and they <laughs> sat around wonder wondering where the next job was going to come from. But, but the, as, as you know, history shows that it was a successful practice that, that got there. Fortunately, and maybe by some stealth, um, uh, there was a project that partially came, came with Ted and the team, and so there was, there was work there. Of course, it wasn't straightforward work, as you, wouldn't, as you might imagine, but Kokomas, uh, three major buildings of which one went to Bath and involved something similar, the similar sort of complex shell structures that, that um, Ian and Michael and the team had been working on in, in Mannheim and all the lovely modeling and form finding that, that Fry was doing gave, gave everyone a lot, a lot to think about, and in those early days without computers. Another project that was already in the formation as Bureau Happold set up was, was this one, the King Abdulaziz University Sports Hall, snappily named. And this I remember Michael, Michael working, working on very directly because I had to slave away at some hand calculations for him uh, to look at membrane stresses. I remember Mike Barnes uh, working away on more sophisticated computer analysis of the cables. This was pretty pioneering days of understanding from an engineer's perspective how these cable nets clad in membranes would, would work. A fabulous piece of work. I'm not sure if Eddie Pugh's arrived. Is Eddie here? Um, but Eddie Pugh, well remembered for going out there and telling them how to, how to erect such a complicated beast. So that was one uh, early project with, with Michael that I remember very well. Having gone to, to Bath, there was the university to think about and great opportunities for research. Ted wanted to, if you like, pick up um, in, in the same manner as Stuttgart, Fry Otto in Stuttgart and the research that was being done, done there and set up a laboratory at Bath University to look into membrane structures and especially uh, uh, inflatable structures. And this, I would say, gave Michael a real a real entry because he was now able to get involved in quite researchy work on, on membranes and cable nets and modeling. Uh, this made sense for a collaboration with Fry Otto. So we certainly saw a, a lot of him. Dennis Hector, if, if he's here, uh, was working there. Um, he's over from America. And um, we started to invent ways of modeling and help Michael and others, Ian, find, find the solutions for these 
these membrane structures that were coming through. Uh, a notable one there was one of these beautiful things that, that Michael worked with Fry on, um, the Munich Avery. Three of these were ultimately built in, in different parts of the world, San Diego and then Hong Kong. One of the things that uh, I remember doing in, in, uh, with Michael in the, in the laboratory was looking at how this now rather elegant and beautiful looking um, masthead would work and a lot of different ideas had to be modelled and thought about before that was resolved. This was one of Michael's strengths I think was, was really focusing in on the, on the detail and you could almost say worrying the detail to death until it was resolved and I think that's what a relationship with Fry needed and, and I noticed in, my, in Michael's writings um, him saying I, I haven't got the whole quote but uh, working, working as an engineer with Fry Otto was not for the faint-hearted. And, and I think I know what he meant. I was always one, one removed from it by, by Michael or Ian, but, but Fry knew what he wanted and expected the engineers to, to find the way. And a, a, a beautiful project, a fabulous story. One was um, wor working out how to weld mesh together was quite a challenge uh, that I remember Michael talking about. And the first winter... Of course, there was a big debate that I remember listening into about, do you really need to design such a, a wide-spaced mesh for snow? Uh, surely it just falls straight through. And I, well, there was quite a strong argument to say, yeah, surely we don't. Fortunately, the argument that says, yes, we do, um, came uh, one, one through. And the very first winter, there it is. Beautiful, but for a structural engineer, a little bit scary. And... While there, Michael uh, got involved in a lot of interesting projects that would pop their way up into the laboratory, and we'd model them for him, and we got very involved in those sorts of, those sorts of things. It was, it was just as well we were doing some research on air-supported structures, because all of a sudden, um, uh, Fry Otto, Ted Happold, um, Arnie Fonelton in Canada were looking at advice as to how to do something as, as massive as this. And I think I see Derek Kroom at the back. I think you were working on this as well, weren't you? This really interesting, very early project, uh, exceptionally imaginative and perhaps a little scary, um, to cover a whole community in Alberta when nobody had done anything quite like this before. Typically, Ted was quite happy to go and explore this and, and say, yes, yeah, surely this is feasible, we will find out how. And it pulled a whole multidisciplinary team together, which is the first time I'd really seen that happening, and was a great opportunity in those early days of the practice. From Michael's point of view, you see him working on more membrane structures, the relationship with Mike, Michael Hopkins kicks in, and I remember him very much working on Basildon Town Centre. It seemed to go on for years as a possible. I don't know if you remember it, Effie, but you do, yes. And it seemed to be where, where he invented fire engineering, or certainly where Bureau Happold first got involved, and the whole idea of covering a town centre with a beautiful, elegant membrane structure, but what happens to all the smoke coming out of those, those shops in a fire, these things really mattered. And again, it gave Michael a real chance to nail into the, the research that was needed. Working with Derek Walker, getting bigger scale, on a project in Hong Kong, just at a time when we'd set up a, a small office in Hong Kong joint venture and we're having some success there. Um, and this shows perhaps a, a, a more pragmatic approach, but every time, I always remember, every time Michael did a new project, there was always some elegance, some integration of, of building systems and structure going in there. Uh, he didn't just do the, the ordinary, even if, if, if the building wasn't immediately, obviously, needing more. Uh, with Michael Hopkins um, and Hampshire County Council, beautiful, elegant school, and these early, early sketches of starting to really think about environment and how you shape a building, how you make sure it's a fit and healthy place for the school children, what you do with the daylight, shade, shade structures and so on. This is a sort of forerunner of many of Michael's projects that, that come along later and, and cementing the project, the uh, relationship with, with Michael Hopkins and Hampshire County Council. That carried on and up somewhat later, this rather more demonstrative uh, piece of construction with timber, with concrete, with membranes, um, was the H Hampshire Cricket uh, Club stand. If we, if we just ke keep going in the, in the membranes scene, this was a very important project in the life of Bureau Happold. And whilst I don't remember the detail, uh, Michael would almost certainly have been involved because the whole office was involved. This was a, a major project of, of building services, environmental uh, civil and structural engineering, and it needed every, every hand to the pump. A very, very elegant project um, as, as, as finally resolved, now known as the Tuareg Palace. 
But it's interesting when you, moving away from those perhaps early projects, a lot of the membrane projects with Fray Otto, as things move on, uh, we see Michael's uh, documents, the slideshows he's showing, uh, talking about some of the bigger buildings. And two very, very important bigger buildings were happening back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, that were, made a big mark on Bureau Hapold. The first major project was, was Bedfont Lakes at Hounslow, uh, a joint venture between MEPC and, and IBM. And I think I see Ian Sharrett at the back there. So Ian Sharrett at, at Michael Hopkins uh, working, uh, and also Ted Cullinan um, on the other side of the square. But he, doesn't, he, he talks about these projects as reclaiming land. The most important thing that he saw in these projects, I think, was taking uh, gravel pits, big holes in the ground that had been left behind. They'd been full of rubbish. They'd been used for refuse from London, and they could be re reinvented, reclaimed. And for him, this was perhaps the most significant part about these projects. I remember a lot of, a lot of detailed engineering. These were big projects for Bureau Hapold, beautiful concrete car parks. It wasn't just any car park. This was a Michael H Hopkins, uh, Michael Dixon beautiful car park. Uh, the, the structures were fine-tuned, elegant structures, um, so much so that I'm delighted to say that they featured on a Bond film some, some years later. Um, and uh, we got a full five minutes exposure um, with uh, Piers Bronson running around all over the roof. But that big project, uh, partly it kicked us off. We had to build a, an, open an office in London on the back of it. But it also led to, sh started to show in England we could actually do this scale of project. And so Michael was, was the lead again on this project, uh, the British Airways headquarters um, just outside Heathrow. Some similarities in, in terms of the land reclamation, another um, derelict and, and waste-filled uh, gravel, gravel workings. Um, lots of ground improvement requirements. So Michael wasn't only about tents and, and lightweight and, and fryato. He was, he was getting right into the serious but still elegant, refined um, major projects. I would say these projects were starting to help kick the practice into, into the mainstream and the practice could grow, the partnership could grow. What's interesting about these shots, I don't have precise dates, but, but in the early days of, of, of Bureau Hapold, in the, in the mid there at about night in the mid 90s, and then on the right, perhaps early 2000s, um, you always see Michael. Interestingly, you always see Michael dead center in each of the shots. <laughs> is, that, is that something that he, he, was, always, he was always doing? <laughs> I'm here sitting down, very nonchalant, uh, now the chairman of, of Bureau Hapold at that point. But it, those sorts of projects were essential to, to get the, to get the, the, the mass into, into Bureau Hapold and the experience that we needed. And Michael was right at the front of those. Meanwhile, of course, Michael is well known for a whole range of beautiful timber projects. We have Richard Harris here who worked with him on almost all of them, probably all of them, and many more besides. And he'll say a few words a little later. I just wanted to give a spectrum of what, what was happening with, with Hampshire County Council, these simple, elegant children's schools, the experimental work that, that Michael did at, at Hook Park uh, with Richard Burton, ABK, with Fry Otto, of course. Very interesting experimental details there. And, and also the Hook Park uh, workshops, taking green timber straight out, th out of the forest, clad, clad there in green, in, in blue plastic. I'm not sure what happened to the plastic. Hopefully it was recycled. Um, and then just bending the green timbers towards each other to make, to make a series of arches. Richard tells me this was one of the scariest projects of his, of his career. It, it looks so incredibly simple, but that's usually the, the case. The simpler it looks, the, the more worrying they've been to achieve that simplicity. But uh, Michael, uh, I think, was rightly proud of these projects and, and the amount of research and innovation that was in them. And, of course, the story of taking local green timbers straight out of the woods uh, at uh, Make Pieces workshops and bringing them into a structure. The AA, the Architectural Association, saw the value of it and, and have, been, have been there ever since, um, uh, using it for workshops and demonstration to their students. In the timber theme, then things moved on. Of course, um, I don't have pictures, but Cullinan's worked on a number of, of Hook Park projects, and then ultimately, uh, with, with Robin, who's here and going to speak, uh, Michael worked on a very innovative uh, grid shell in the Wilden Downland Museum in, in Sussex, near, near um, Chichester. 
an interesting one for me where the, uh, you see the simple forms, the three uh, shell forms um, uh, in timber, in a lattice of timber, a little reminiscent of Mannheim, but, but different, and then clad in a, in, a, in a very, very different way, not in a smooth skin, but in a panelized cladding system. I'm sure that would have been a, a major challenge, but I think important to make that break and to say that you know, there are ways of cladding these structures which aren't, aren't hugging them, but are but are supporting them, allowing ventilation and, and so on. So quite a good advance. But whenever Michael did something, he, it never seemed to be quite the same. There was always a new story. Uh, when he used Glulam, he used it in some of the most elegant ways. This one with, with Ian Sharrett, with Pringle Richard Sharrett at, at this point, beautiful winter garden in Sheffield. With Cullinan's beautiful um, botanical gardens um, visitor center in Edinburgh. Always that refined considering of detail as well. So much of the architecture was in the detail with the structure, how the structural forces move from one place to another, always celebrated in, in things that Michael did. And the last timber project I'm, I'm showing, um, one, of the most, one of the latest ones that won the, um, the Sterling Prize and I seem to remember the Institution of Structural Engineers, uh, accolade, a highest accolade for, of the year as, as a structure, uh, is the Savile Gardens um, Visitor Center. Very elegant, very beautiful. And again, a rather interesting combination of steel and, and timber to give this very slim, elegant shape required quite a lot of hard work on the engineering, uh, which you can almost see in the, in the, in the edge detailing there. And a, a nice slide from Michael of looking always at the whole list of his timber projects along the bottom, always looking at how do they categorize. There's quite a Germanic way about it of, of how do we categorize each of those projects in different ways of, of construction and innovation on the right with Wilden Downland and Hook Park in particular. Moving on from, from, from timber to cardboard, of course. Why, who wouldn't want to build in cardboard? Um, with Cottrell and Vermeulen, um, this beautiful little uh, cardboard school which was certainly famous at the time and got plenty of television coverage, and then on to the pretty famous, sadly uh, dismantled Japanese pavilion in Hanover with Shiguru Ban and Fryato. Now we have uh, Paul Rogers, who worked with Michael a lot on projects in, in, in Germany. We'll be speaking about this a little, a little later. But you can see the elegance. You can see the similarities with, with the Wild and Downland, but also there are the many differences. And I would think one of the differences, Paul, was was that there's a proof engineer in Germany and they don't half late make life more difficult and complicated. So we knew it would stand up, but you had to probably do a few extra things to, so that he also knew it would stand up. But a, a lovely, elegant result out of that and something that Michael was very proud of. Stone and glass didn't go, didn't go unnoticed with Michael when he worked in stone. He didn't just pile them on top of each other. Of course, working with Michael Hopkins, they didn't want to do that either. So. Uh, the stone is actually um, post-tensioned columns so that it gives them a contribution to the stability. Lots of hard work involved. I remember being in the office um, when the panics came out that the test column was failing. What were we going to do? What were we going to do? We ended up, this, the, each column had to be meticulously supervised in construction uh, to make sure the bedding was quite right. And if Claire Smith is in the room, uh, she'll remember it very, very well. Now, a, a once an engineer with us, now a partner. Um, well deserved. And in glass, not that often glass is used structurally, now it's, it's common for um, rather elegant stairs and the odd glass box, um, but Michael was doing it many years earlier for, would you imagine, a bell tower. So these big heavy clanging things um, are supported structurally on glass. Um, I do seem to remember that one gave him quite a lot of thought, room for thought. I expect he had a few sleepless nights, but a beautiful Beautiful, ele elegant result. This was something that got built in Basildon, which is, which is nice. When working in steel, there was nothing conventional about Michael working in steel. Uh, working with Fry Otto on elevated railways through Germany uh, for the magnet barn, high-speed rail, coming up with very elegant, beautiful solutions, tree-like solutions. Ultimately, that wasn't built, but expressed perhaps the sort of ethos of it in the Mecklenburg Bridge. Uh, which is very, a fascinating little piece of structural engineering uh, Paul Rogers may speak of, and inspiring us as a team to 
go a little further, we have, we have I'm, I'm pleased to say, Spencer de Grey, a good school friend of Michael here. He, um, Michael was always ensuring that, that we work the hardest and the best to, to, to deliver the most elegant solution. And so in, st in this steel shell, uh, we were able to deliver something very, very light and uh, lasting for the British Museum. And also say, when we're doing just a shed, working with Neil Squibbs, um, always working with the shape making it efficient, using shells, using arches, and yet trying to keep the costs as if it were just an ordinary shed. That was a, a real inspiration whenever we've been working in steel. He also worked on tall buildings. Uh, this one in Essen was, was completed after an earlier competition in Frankfurt, which was uh, won by Foster and Partners rather than in a Ingerhofen, who we were working with. Um, but we got to build this one in Essen. Beautiful, uh, double skin, as you can see on the right-hand side, absolutely elegant um, uh, exposed soffit slabs, very integrated building services and structural design. And then a little later working with, with Foster and Partners and Spencer de Grey on the beautiful Faisalia Tower with very simple structural diagram on the left where you can see the loads gathering to the, to the four corners and allowing the very lightweight columns in the center by virtue of these bridges that are spanning at inter intermediate levels a sort of move built off the ideas of Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. When working in concrete, some really elegant uh, early concrete buildings. This, this with, uh, with Michael Hopkins, expressed soffits. This is when environmental <coughs> engineering integrated with, with structurals was really starting to be very interesting. How can we minimize the need for air conditioning, maximize the cooling at night? And, and expose soffits and make them beautiful. Taken one step further on Slumberger, the low slung building in front of the big, the big tension structure. A beautiful um, shaped soffits in Slumberger. You can see them again here. So even in concrete, uh, you could rely on Michael to be innovative, but never more so than on Stuttgart 21, uh, which was uh, when, when Fry Otto starts to inspire, inspire form and design it, it really starts to uh, get interesting. So perhaps inspired by the, uh, the laboratory buildings in, in Stuttgart, the IL uh, building turned upside down. So this isn't a mistake. This is <laughs> supposed to be upside down. Um, if we can do the left hand in, in, in cables, couldn't we do the right hand in concrete? I think it turns out that the answer isn't a simple yes, but... Um, this was the inspiration and the excitement of can we make these beautiful um, scallop shapes as an inverted support system to a concrete shell? And could we then use that concrete shell as a beautiful sculptural form above a railway station with a garden for the public over the top? It's now being built. Paul will probably touch on this. And with, we hope to see something as elegant as this. Very Michael's determination and hard work on that project to help deliver with Fry and, and Christoph Ingerhofen this sort of solution uh, was, was really uh, vitally important to get this happening. He didn't give up. Um, and, and I think he saw the special, how special this building would be and put, it all, put his all into it. I think it also caused him a lot of sleepless nights. This was the time of... of of integrated buildings, as I say, but that moved on to the BRE Low Energy Office. I won't, won't really dwell on it, but starting to integrate the structure and the airflow and the cooling, the natural cooling. Wessex Water with Bennett's Associates. Um, these are almost certainly to uh, Tony McLaughlin's environmental drawings that he was so good at. He always knew which way the arrows went. And, and I know Tony's here. We still appreciate your arrows. We wish you were still with us. Um, and the beautiful uh, math school in, in Cambridge, concrete and, and the expressed connections, always a feature, the connections. How do the forces get from A to B? Let's, let's enjoy and celebrate it. And the final one on concrete, you have to mention Genzyme, beautifully ultra-slim concrete slabs uh, built in the States, Banish, the architects, Banish and Banish. But this, this is a building that's, that's so light and so, so slim that, that the light seems to just flood through. It, 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 it creates a lightness a, and a lightness of spirit. And I think this is where I was really starting to hear Michael talking about how the buildings of this quality really affect the, the, the people 
and we were starting to see the power that that had for Genzyme, the client, in, in giving them um, retaining staff, creating greater productivity. And that, that results of quality design on people was really, really important. So moving away from projects, um, looking at some of the other things, a lot of, Michael was talking very often about sustainability, about, about the damage we were doing to the planet, how engineers could, could help make a difference. Very early cuttings, a beautiful little diagram that, that is so up to date, I'm going to be stealing it and making it, um, the, uh, some, using it myself. Um, looking right from building systems through environment, the activities in the buildings, finally to the objectives, how we engineers can, can affect the final objectives of a building by getting the engineering right, the productivity, the adaptability, the morale, he even uses the word, in the buildings. He used these beautiful little diagrams to really emphasize the importance of first seek to reduce the material use, then seek to refurbish what you've got, do you really need to build new, then seek to reuse things that are already in use, and then, only then, think about recycling and churning through what you've already got, but do at least recycle. Um, that in nature and this in, in real life, the four hours for man, as I put it. And this diagram of his, many of you will have seen in, in lectures, I'm sure, kind of symbolizes that. It's a lovely Michael-style diagram. It's a little bit complicated, but it really, um, it really deserves study. It's one of those that you go away and think, wow, yes, it's, it's all there. It's all there. And I'm not going to go through it. But, but this is really important, I think. Michael, the communicator, uh, he had a way of taking really complex things and, and simpling, simplifying them down without losing without losing anything. And all of this is really about, about people, and it strikes me that, that um, he was, was a master of realizing that. He was touching the earth lightly, as I put it. He was also helping grow people, uh, people in, certainly in Bureau Happold and beyond, we'll see, um, helping them to de develop their careers. Um, and he was forming really strong relationships with clients, makers, users, um, everything that's caught a good design. So talking about good design, I have to just mention his commitment to design quality, saying our architectural structures need to contribute to the beauty of the built environment towards total comfort perceived by the occupiers, who are in all senses the integrators of acoustic, thermal, spatial, social, and visual environment. A lot of words, but um, that is absolutely core to, to the importance of engineers in buildings today. And people are the key factor, how people sense the building. They integrate um, all of the environmental factors into their response. Um, he was saying this uh, very early on. One thing that I wanted to bring up was the design quality index. When Michael gets hold of something, Latin has to come in. You don't go to Eton for, for nothing. Um, and this uh, passion for uh, finding a way to get the importance of quality over um, into the industry uh, and spending a little more money on design quality was really strong. And working with the CIC, with Robin, um, a very simple diagram. And the important thing is, based on Vitruvius, um, utilitas, firmitas, and venustas, which of course is delight. And, and seeing buildings as needing to have an essence of, of delight in them and creating a simple, helpful, easy to use tool. Of course, sometimes Michael's uh, diagrams were got a little carried away. Um, and I wouldn't begin to want to go, but I bet you this really does work. <laughs> but fortunately, he also simplifies. And, and at the heart of this uh, design quality index, there is, there is where does excellence lie? Excellence has to lie in that balance of function, impact, and quality. And it just has to be pulled and tweaked by those other factors that, that we have to deal with, like finance, human resources, time and resources. So um, nice diagrams. And these are things that Michael was so often talking about. I expect most of you have seen him talk about it. So I'm, I wanted you to, to see that. This is the final one of these. Just ultimately, the beautiful little diagram. We've all got our way of saying this. But if you just spend a little bit more money on design, the red uplift on, on, on the left-hand side of the histogram, uh, you'll get a huge, great benefit in terms of the operational costs that reduce 
and even more important, the benefits to the occupiers who'll be there for 10, 20, 50 years. If they're a little bit happier, a little bit more delighted, a little bit more efficient, you will get massive benefits. Um, we all know how important that is, but this was Michael's way of saying it and a, an early way of saying it. Education was incredibly important to Michael. Design, engineering design has to be based on intuition as much as calculation. Lovely little, lovely little phrase. And we've just had a, as, as Martin said, we've had a, a big conference. That could have been at the core of what we were talking about. How do we bring that intuition? How do we bring that experience into education so that it's not just about calculation? He's been writing, he's already published one book, another is on its way. This is one way of communicating his message to a further generation. It's fantastic that that's, that that's happened. Taught in many places, particularly at University of Bath for many years, and, and recently um, uh, awarded the Doctorate of Engineering. And there's Tim next to Michael on a happy day. His commitment is, is, is stated here. I think I'll let you have a quick look if you want to at the words. But all those things are exactly the things that are still very, very relevant, very, very important to the way we teach engineering. And there is certainly a move to take more and more of this on board, I'm, I'm pleased to say. And some quite revolutionary talk, I thought, today in the, in the conference, if we can get any of it to happen. His commitment to education, also very proud of his... his, his um, being a trustee of the Creative Education Trust. Um, here he is in action. And this, this trust runs an, a network of non-selective state schools, um, very much uh, on the basis of increasing the creativity activity of young, young children. On the, on the website, I see 14 academies under this, under this umbrella, something that was very important to Michael. And finally, here on education, the Happel Foundation, he was a chair of that foundation for many, many years. Um, it's, it's very healthy and it continues, dedicated to using engineering skills and experience to make a positive impact on people's lives, particularly in education and helping award scholarships, um, go out into schools and provide engineering insights and so on. Something Michael was very, very passionate about. Um, finally... Finally, I thought, um, wh where, do we, where do we go for what, it, what Michael is saying? Because all of this amazing, amazing activity that we've seen in his, in his career, um, he tells us it's everywhere and supports all human activity. The principal constituent for the longe longevity, robustness, sustainability required by society and everything in society. Sustainability needs to be applied in all cultures, climates, geographical locations. And the thing I really want to emphasize, this calls for an ethical stance. We haven't talked about that very much, but that was right at the, at the heart of, of Michael's thinking, I think. There's always this sense of what's right, what's, what's right for the future, future generations. An ethical stance, and very often the confidence to depart from the norm and innovate, which I think is what we've, which, what we've seen him do. We've seen it in steel, in concrete, in timber, innovating. In stone, in cardboard, in glass, innovating. So I, I think we know he had the ethical stance that he talks about. We know he had the confidence to depart and the willingness to work hard to depart from the norm and innovate. So I would say, Michael, with your beautiful bells supported by glass in Basildon, um, and this is something that he would say at the end of his lectures sometimes, let, let the bells ring out. Let's let the bells ring out for Michael, Michael the engineer that we know, that we love, and that we respect deeply for all that he's done for us and, and for the industry. And thank you to Michael.